Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Last night, seven people yelled at each other for two hours on national television while a rowdy audience cheered and booed. Joe Biden, Mike Bloomberg, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, Tom Steyer, and Elizabeth Warren took the stage in Charleston, South Carolina for the most chaotic debate yet, which was hosted by CBS and loosely moderated by Gail King, Nora O'Donnell, and other CBS journalists. In case you missed it, Here's a little taste of what the debate was like. Broken promises I, I, that sound good on bumper stickers. Me. Mr. Steyer, Mr. Steyer. I think we're talking we'll about that. We'll get to you, Mr. Sanders. Let's talk let about me, it. Can I Steyer. say something? Right. Look, first of all, yeah. first, Bernie, first, let, me go. No, let me go. I think, Tom, I think she was talking about my plan, not yours. <laughs> that was a very good cut. terrible clip. Yeah. Uh, what the hell happened last night, guys? Uh, and why do you think this particular debate was so chaotic? I just wanted to first say that I really like a lot of reporters at CBS, especially Nora O'Donnell, especially Gail, especially uh, the fact that Margaret Brennan actually cares about foreign policy and talks about this stuff on her show. But like they, their rules didn't get enforced. We moved on from topics right when they were getting interesting. I thought the framing of a lot of the questions was just terrible. It, it was like it like sort of bought into Republican talking points or ignored facts or I, I don't know. It was I've never been this consistently frustrated. Never at, at a debate. Love it. Yeah, it was a toxic and unhelpful affair, I'd say. <laughs> uh, it was hard to say there was any one reason it felt so um, dispiriting to observe. I think one one reason is, is the candidates. I think they all came in with um, uh, countervailing purposes, uh, multiple different tacks to t- take on Bernie Sanders, take on Mike Bloomberg, take on each other, reframe their position in the race at a moment when, for a lot of these candidates, it will either be the first or the last debate of the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I think, to Tommy's point, I think some of the questions uh, didn't provide an opportunity for any kind of sort of elucidating answers. I mean, it would be the first debate to talk about coronavirus. The question was incredibly specific. Will you seal the borders? It was, was uh, you know, the question about... Yeah, that was weird. It doesn't solve the problem. It's something dumb that Trump told us to do around Ebola, which you know, was unhelpful. The, 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 the question framed around uh, Putin, the question f- for Israel framed around what Jews will accept or what exactly the framing was, it, it all it all lent itself to, I think, the worst impulses of some of the candidates and uh, to the worst impulses of political media right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll start with, you know, in defense of the moderators, I think this debate would have been challenging for anyone because the candidates came ready to attack each other uh, in part because like you said love it for many of them this is their last chance and so they were on edge to begin with that said um, and i also love gail king love nora o'donnell i think margaret brennan is a good journalist like just so it's hard even saying this about them but it, it just was not moderated well and i think one of the problems was when a candidate would challenge another candidate the candidate who was challenged didn't even get to fully respond because then a bunch of other candidates jumped in. And I think it made all the candidates look bad because you'd get attacked, you'd try to respond, and then someone would cut you off. And so you didn't even really get to defend yourself. And And that happened to almost all the candidates. I don't know what you do. Do you go to break early and say, hey, everybody, we got to enforce these rules. This is a nightmare. It makes all of you look bad. Like, I'm not sure. But like, you know, Biden complained about not getting time like four or five different times. And so you could see that it was impacting him and his performance. Now, I think a savvy debater knows that you've got to stop complaining about the refs and just adjust your strategy, right? That's true in any sport, anything you ever do. Yeah. We've all said this before. There should be no crowds at debates. I, I think it I is agree. It is always bad. And look, there was a lot of complaints last night because there was some local story about how the tickets were super expensive, um, though there's a lot of conflicting reports about that. The DNC says that, like always, they split a lot of the tickets, even the, the DNC said that most of the tickets were evenly distributed among the campaigns, the Congressional Black Caucus, the South Carolina Democratic Party, CBS and Twitter. The South Carolina Democratic Party says that they actually did not sell their 400 tickets, but gave them to activists and local officials. And this is what happened in the past. And in, in other debates, the state parties do sell their tickets. But regardless, each campaign had their own supporters evenly distributed in the audience. And those supporters decided to boo, cheer. They particularly um, cheered some of the moderate candidates, whether it was Bloomberg or Pete or Biden. Elizabeth Warren got booed once. And so, but like, 
the way to handle that is just we, it's crazy to have these big crowds and, and turn it into a rally. We, the Democratic Party is seated. The Republicans too. We've ceded too much control to TV networks that are putting on a show that gets ratings and they run ads. We should pull back this entire process, put it on C-SPAN, put it on PBS. No audience, no jeering, no bullshit. This is too important for a night like last night. And yeah. have progressive activists and and people who know these issues ask the questions like we've been saying for a long time. I will say though, you know, I I, I tend to agree with that. First of all, it's it's amazing how many incredibly important lessons we're learning for the next primary after the most important primary in history. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit frustrating. But but I, I, there is a little, you know, on the other hand, right, the last debate, which I think was also a bit contentious, but nonetheless, I think we came away feeling a bit energized because it was um, a tough debate for some of the candidates. It was feisty, but it felt like these were candidates sort of on their game trying to make their best case uh, was also on uh, a major media network. And, the tr you know, I think the argument in favor of doing it with these companies is they have the ability to reach 10, 20 million people. But at the same time, they can air it. They just don't get to control it. Yeah. And they don't enough. get to make money off it. Uh, I don't give a shit about CBS making money on a debate. No, I agree. And, and I believe the uh, the uh, period on the end of the sentence was the, we'll be right back. Watch some more commercials. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> right. That was incredible, Dan. I lost my mind. Um, all right. So one of the reasons things got a little tense is because all the candidates suddenly realized that Bernie Sanders has a decent <laughs> chance of winning a pledge delegate lead on Super Tuesday that is basically insurmountable for the rest of the primary. Again, to all those listening, this is just the math. This is not us. <laughs> saying like Bernie's going to win because we think like, Bernie should win. It is just it, go look at the pledge delegate math. Go look at the states. Go look at the polls. It is certainly it is far from certain, maybe even less uh, far from certain after last night, because now Joe Biden looks like he's in a good position in South Carolina. But um, Bernie is the prohibitive favorite right now just because of the math and the calendar. Um, and for that reason, every other candidate directly challenged him more than in any other debate. Here are some of the greatest hits. Super Tuesday states, Thank one third you, of America will vote. Do you want to have someone you, in charge of this ticket? Could I finish, Margaret? Well, you're Do you want time, to have someone Sarah. in charge of this ticket who wants to put forward $60 trillion in spending, three times the Thank American you, economy? Well, I don't Whitaker. think we do. I passed the Brady Bill with waiting periods. I led that fight. But my friend on my right and others have, in fact, also given to the gun manufacturers absolute immunity. Imagine if I stood here and said we give immunity to drug companies, we give immunity to tobacco companies. That has caused carnage on our streets. Bernie and I agree on a lot of things, but I think I would make a better president than Bernie. And the reason for that is that getting a progressive agenda enacted is going to be really hard, and it's going to take someone who digs into the details to make it happen. Bernie and I both wanted to help rein in Wall Street. In 2008, we both got our chance. But I dug in, I fought the big banks, I built the coalitions, and I won. Bernie and I both want to see universal health care, but Bernie's plan doesn't explain how to get there, doesn't show how we're going to get enough allies into it, Thank and you. doesn't show enough about Thank how we're going to pay for it. Thank I dug in, I did the work, and then Bernie's team trashed me for it. We need a president who is going to dig in, do the hard work, and actually get it done. Progressives have got one shot, and we need to spend it with a leader who will get something done. Here, we just cannot afford some of the stuff people talk about. But if you, let's, let me finish. If you keep on going, we will elect Bernie. Bernie will lose to Donald Trump. And Donald Trump and the House and the Senate and some of the state houses will all go red and then between gerrymandering and appointing judges for the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to live with this Mayor catastrophe. Thank you. I will Look, Hello. if you want to keep the House in Democratic hands, you might want to check with the people who actually turned the House blue. Forty Democrats who are not running you on your platform. They are running away from your platform as fast as they possibly can. Hi, I want to send those Democrats back to the Vice United President States Biden. House. Let's Wait listen to them Vice when President they say Biden, that they don't want to be out there okay. defending Thank you, Senator Sanders. Thank you, Mayor and I am not looking forward to a scenario where it comes down to Donald Trump with his nostalgia for the social order of the 1950s and Bernie Sanders with a nostalgia for the revolutionary politics of the 1960s. This is not about what coups were happening in the 1970s or 80s. This is about the future. This is about 2020.
Which of these, um, which of this buffet of attacks on Bernie Sanders do you guys think was most effective? And, and, and how do you think overall in the debate Bernie handled all the incoming? That's a great question. I, I have no idea. You know, it was it was attacks on Bernie in a bunch of different directions. I mean, just me personally, I think the argument Elizabeth Warren make, is making from progressivism uh, is, uh, I think, has been a part of her argument she hasn't made before, saying basically, uh, you know, Bernie is a blunt instrument, and I will come in and get into the nooks and crannies of our government, and, and you can trust me to do that. And I think that that speaks to her inherent strengths as a candidate. I don't know about the gun attack on Bernie. It's something Hillary Clinton tried. Uh, uh, and, you know, I don't know how effective that is. Uh, you know, Pete, Pete's making a case that I think Biden would also make about uh, vulnerable House members. And do, Bloomberg. And Bloomberg. Uh, but, but, you know, it's interesting hearing Pete make the argument because he always ends up back at some kind of like rhetorical flourish that feels very canned and rehearsed, you know, the, the, the politics of the 50s, the revolutionary politics of the 60s, what have you. I and should it, say, in fairness, that we cut them together. Yeah, no. That I, was later in the debate, and the and the House seat one was earlier. We right, put them both together. Right. But just in, in general, I found him to be, uh, uh, at times, you know, as he has been in these debates, incredibly polished, incredibly well prepared, uh, incredibly quick on his feet, while at the same time, I think, feeling a little bit rote. Um, you know, as for Mike Bloomberg, you know, he's. Uh, He's got one debate to practice in. I think he could use a couple more. Fear that one of these candidates, whoever we nominate, is not going to be able to beat Donald Trump has sort of been the driving force behind the entire primary. And so that's why I actually think that Pete's argument and Bloomberg's argument, which went to electability, were far more effective for voters who are wondering, um, am I, are we picking the right person to face Donald Trump? I think Elizabeth Warren's argument is probably the most substantively fair argument, yeah. but that's mm -hmm. about once you're governing. She's basically saying, I'm going to be a more effective president than Bernie is. And I think she make a very good case for that based on the fact that, you know, she later talked about the filibuster, how she wants to get rid of the filibuster. And, and Pete made that argument as well, that he wants she to get rid of right the filibuster. She is right. She is right. And Pete is right. And they both hit Bernie for not wanting to get rid of the filibuster. I think Elizabeth Warren made a great point that in 2008, both of them wanted to take on the banks. She ended up creating, helping create the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Bernie did not. Um, so those are all good arguments about how she'd be more effective governing, but doesn't really say why it, it doesn't get to the electability fears. As that, that case could be salient in the hands of a candidate with a really strong electability argument. So this is and the whole, no, it goes back and, to it's all relative, right? And not mm -hmm. one of them has it. You know, Joe Biden can claim it, but he has performed poorly in the first few states and he has not seemed particularly live or strong on these debate stages. Uh, Pete has shown himself unable to uh, uh, appeal to the base of the Democratic Party, which is black voters. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has consistently polled lower than Bernie and Biden. Uh, when you go to the head to heads, which you should take with a grain of salt, but nonetheless show a delta that's uh, that's never been erased. Uh, Amy Klobuchar has collapsed since uh, New Hampshire, and I don't particularly understand what Tom Steyer is doing there. Bloomberg, the 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 white knight, uh, has been. Uh, not a good performer. The candidate has not matched the spending of his campaign. And so, yeah, you know, everybody can throw the kitchen sink at Bernie, but it's it's the same problem as always. No one's provided themselves as the alternative, and none of these people are dropping out to allow one to, uh, to And none of these people have, have seen the strength in a fellow alternative uh, to see the reason to drop out and get behind anybody else. So I'd say one of the most uh, contentious exchanges involving Bernie was when uh, Joe Biden uh, brought up his comments that he made on 60 Minutes about how um, the Cuban government had literacy programs and those were good, despite condemning authoritarianism in general. Um, let's listen to that clip. Barack Obama was abroad. He was in a town meeting. He did not in any way suggest that there was anything positive about the Cuban government. He acknowledged that they did increase life expectancy, but he went on and condemned the dictatorship. He went on and condemned the people who, in fact, had run that committee. He also made sure to make it clear. And by the way, I called to make sure that I was prepared to. I was. I never say my in my private conversation with. But the fact of the matter is, he in fact does not did not, has never embraced an authoritarian regime, and does not now. Okay. This man said that, in fact, he thought it was, he did not condemn what that they did. That is untrue, categorically untrue. What, what did you tell him? 
I have condemned authoritarianism, whether it is the people in Saudi Arabia that the United States government has Cuba, loved for years, Cuba, Nicaragua. Authoritarianism of any stripe is bad. But Period. that is different than saying that governments occasionally do things that are good. Look, that's what Barack on. Obama said. No, no, that's the only way we go. So, Tommy, what, what did you think about that whole exchange and this, uh, and this debate? Uh, over authoritarianism in Cuba in general. So this was another example where I thought the the moderators did a disservice to the conversation. The question was, Bernie, you praise the Chinese Communist Party for raising more people out of extreme poverty than other, any other country. You have a track record of praising these socialist governments. Can voters trust a democratic socialist president to not give authoritarians a free pass? <laughs> and I just think, I said that was a little shaded. <laughs> I, I just think that's such an unsophisticated question. So first, like the facts on China and poverty. Here's a quote from Barack Obama in 2015. Given China's success in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, which was one of the most remarkable achievements in human history, blah, 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 blah. Right. So it's it's not offensive to America. I remember that line to state. I remember fact. him saying that. Yeah. Now, I do think you can you can say, OK, Bernie Sanders will have an electability problem in some communities, especially in Florida, given the tone uh, where they feel like he is being insufficiently critical of Fidel Castro or Venezuela or some of these other places. But I hate when we get in these debates and we skip past the facts and the reality first. And, you know, like there's just so many times in, in politics where I think candidates are told your perspective is true, but you can't say that because it's politically damaging. And that pissed off Barack Obama. That probably pisses off every politician. Bernie Sanders has even less time for it. But I, I did think, like, I don't know that Bernie got himself out of the problem here, which is a bunch of Democrats in South Florida going on the record to criticize what he said about Castro, right? Like, that problem will still exist. But it was, like, I, I could feel his frustration where he's in a position where he seemingly has to just, you know, sing the national anthem or, or whatever, like, whatever the bar is for talking about American exceptionalism and not say, actually... In, in China, they did some things well. In Cuba, they did some things well. In the America, we fucked some things up. Like, we, we can be adults about this and have a conversation. I, when I first heard him say this on 60 Minutes and I and I first heard the controversy, um, I, I, co I completely understood what his answer was meant to be, right? Because part of what they were saying, what part of what Bernie was saying is they were asking, you know, one of the reasons that a lot of Cuban people didn't join with the U.S. in trying to overthrow Castro is, um, A, of course, there was horrible authoritarianism and they didn't have the freedom to do so, but B, you know, Castro had these literacy programs and this is what authoritarian governments do, right? Like they give out goods and services to people as a way to sort of keep them under their thumb, right? Like it's not a good thing, but that's what they do. And Bernie was sort of explaining that. So I didn't think it was as big of a deal, but then he was asked about it in a town hall on CNN the night before the debate. He was asked about it at the debate. And if I were Bernie in that situation, I would have gone much harder at condemning, being very clear. And he said, oh, I've condemned authoritarianism. But it was sort of a passing thing. And then he was like really defensive about it. I think you could then go on and say Fidel Castro was, you know, ran a horrible regime. He, there were human rights abuses that were terrible. Like he could have spent a little more time condemning the authoritarians and the dictators before he defended himself. And so I wasn't sure he handled it in the best way. Yeah. I mean, look, I think it's a, ultimately a, it was a pretty puerile debate and Bernie's being attacked because uh, there are people who think he particularly has a political liability on these things. Uh, and there are some who believe he has a genuine sympathy for these governments. That is a and he has denounced authoritarianism. I think he has to just do a little extra work there. Yeah, a little even extra though work. the debate is childish. That's yeah, all. look, politics is stupid, right? right? We spent months and months and months debating why Barack Obama didn't wear a fucking flag pin yeah. on his suit, right? The dumbest things in the world will become the focus of this campaign, and you have to know that, prepare for it, and then just deal with it uh, deftly and, and politically smartly when it comes up. I think Bernie went right to Saudi Arabia in part because what's clearly it just sort of like riles him fairly. Like, what is this hypocrisy on mm -hmm. this stage? We've got a we've got a Amer America's sympathetic relationship, to put it lightly, with Saudi Arabia. And I'm being criticized for 50 year old comments and for denouncing authoritarianism while noting that certain left wing authoritarian governments have done positive things in those countries, which as a country that is a democracy that is based on ideas and, a, and, and trying to tell the truth, we ought to be honest about the ways in which other governments that are different than, different than ours do good things, even when we abhor 
their systems. Bernie has to understand this. Again, if he's going to be the nominee of the party, he knows what the attacks are going to be. It's not going to be from Donald Trump, your programs cost a little too much money. No. <laughs> it's going to be, you are a socialist. You are in line with other socialist left-wing governments throughout history and throughout the world now. You are a scary, you know, like all, all this kind of stuff. And Bernie has a, you know, he said it in his speech about democratic socialism, like the twin problems we face are oligarchy and authoritarianism. That was his whole speech. And he could be a little tougher on the authoritarianism part on a big stage like that. Where are we now uh, headed into uh, headed into South Carolina and Super Tuesday? Oh, I think we're in hell, John. Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> we're certainly in more uncertainty. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I wonder if it's not pretty simple, which is the fundamental dynamics of this race are that Bernie Sanders will be the nominee unless one alternative emerges. We come out of this debate, which was a messy, sloppy, uh, um, ugly conversation, which no one looked particularly good. So I don't know who got helped. And if nobody got helped, then the situation hasn't changed. And if the situation hasn't changed, Bernie did, Bernie, Bernie came away yeah, ahead. I think mm -hmm. that's a fair assessment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I do think, I think probably... Not just because of the debate, but because of some of the other developments, the Clyburn endorsement, the polls heading into South Carolina, that Biden is in a probably the strongest position he's been in uh, for a while, uh, probably since before Iowa, mm -hmm. when he had horrible uh, results in Iowa and New Hampshire. And now Biden sort of has this moment again to basically step up and prove that he's the the one to take on Bernie Sanders and in, in Super Tuesday. And I don't think it will force Mike Bloomberg from the race, but at least it could drag Bloomberg's poll numbers down a little bit more. And the question for Joe Biden is, can he can he sort of execute now? Mm -hmm. um, can he step up where he hasn't been able to step up before? Because, um, you know, time is running short. Yeah, I mean, look, Bloomberg got beat up a lot last night, and he's not even on the ballot in South Carolina, so he doesn't even have a chance to show something show positive. Show something, yeah. right, this weekend. Uh, I, I would worry if I were Bloomberg... Uh, given the trajectory and the momentum his campaign has. Like, at some point, you cannot buy your way through getting the shit kicked out of you. I do think one of the reasons I feel like kind of, I don't know, kind of like a dull fear <laughs> is not just because of how ugly the debate was. It's how much external, how many external factors have interceded into what isn't this incredibly important primary. It's the the mess in Iowa. It's an ugly debate right before uh, before South Carolina. Simply the the fact that the calendar has proven to be, I think, um, uh, so compressed in a way that has uh, left these candidates scrambling and unsure how to kind of make their best case as Super Tuesday is three days after this primary. Mm -hmm. The intersect, the, 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 the involvement of billionaires coming in and throwing hundreds of million dollars and kind of like scrambling the polls and, and changing the dynamics of the race and, and becoming a force, even if neither one of them is, has really any significant shot of being the nominee. And all of that left me a bit just sort of worried that in this incredibly important moment, we are uh, coming up against so many obstacles on top of all of the ones we know that will be waiting for us once we do have a nominee. The freak out about Bernie as a potential nominee this week from uh, a lot of the Democratic establishment, the media, ha has worried me because like we've all expressed concerns about Bernie's electability on this pod, but I think we've expressed them in sort of a... Um, I don't know, an even-keeled way. <laughs> and I was sort of surprised to see the level of concern with, from a lot of Democrats. And not like the fucking James Carville types who start screaming on television because they're just, that, that's going to be them. But, you know, actual Democratic officials who aren't sort of prone to this kind of thing. Um, and I think, and it, look, and part of this is, I think Bernie did a good job. I think Bernie did a fairly good job last night, probably not as well as he could have, um, sort of fending off the attacks. But... I do think Bernie has to keep in mind as he moves forward that um, his job is going to be, if he, especially if he's the nominee of the party, reassurance and reassure a lot of not just like establishment types in D.C. who are annoying, but like a lot of Democratic voters out there that he needs that um, he's going to be able to be the strongest, uh, the strongest candidate against Donald Trump. So we will see.